He moves through the death and decay of the void. He doesn't remember his name. Everything's a blur. He feels pain in his stomach, in his arms, in his veins. He needs... He needs to find one of those flowers. The nectar, the sweet serum that gives strength. Strength for what? He remembers. The killers. Experimenting on them. Why? Why was he experimenting on them? He doesn't remember. He caused a lot of suffering, but he doesn't feel remorse. He doesn't even know if he should feel remorse. He doesn't feel anything but an ache in the pit of his stomach for power. He has flashes of the doctor, his screams, his agony, turning the tables on him, experimenting on him like he had done with so many others. Where? Not here. Somewhere else. Another world. All of these, these survivors, marooned from other worlds. How does he know this? He doesn't remember. He remembers the experiments. What was he trying to understand? The nectar? The serum? The right dose? The right dose. To use without hurting himself. Too late. He feels the hunger. Not for food or drink, not for talk or fun. For a flower, a single flower, for serum. He knows the entity is watching him. He knows it, feels it inside his bones. He doesn't want to be snatched for another trial, to suffer or cause suffering, and to what end? The great horrible mystery of it all. He wants to understand this place, he does. But he senses that to know, to really know would drive him mad. Madness, that's what this place is. The embodiment of madness. He doesn't want to be pulled into another trial. He wants to return home. He must return home. That's why he was studying the serum. It gave him insight. Insight to what? He doesn't remember. Home. He doesn't even remember where home is. He only remembers the void. Hundreds, maybe thousands of discarded survivors. Not dead, not alive, something else. Alive but dead inside. Burnt, emotionless, useless to the entity. He remembers. He remembers rising from the void, finding a flower. Had this flower been his salvation? Had the flower been his way out? He falls to his knees and shouts at the abyss, and the abyss answers with silence. The silence is so deafening it hurts. He buckles over, climbs to his knees. He needs serum. He's lost. He doesn't know where he is. He sees things like tentacles reaching out for him from the fog, and he knows they're not real. None of it is. He's losing his mind if he hasn't lost it already. His eyes play tricks on him. He sees giant, nameless creatures looming over him. Doesn't matter. They're not real. None of it is. His hunger confuses him, oppresses him. He'd do anything for that feeling again. Anything. Even return to the trials. He would. He'd rip survivors and killers apart, limb from limb, for that feeling again. He begins to mumble words, a promise. One flower, one flower, and I will do anything. Claudette is seven years old and feels alone, very alone. Yes, her parents love her. Yes, they want the world for her, but the world doesn't want her. Or at least that's what Claudette believes. She just wants to fit in, fit in at school, fit in with her cousins, fit in with her teammates on the soccer pitch. But fitting in isn't as simple as being like others. She's different, and she knows it. She feels slow, unresponsive, not quick enough to understand her teacher or keep up with her class. The librarian calls her adult-minded. When she talks, she stutters. Sometimes she loses her breath and has trouble recognizing when she's talking too loudly. But most of all, her teacher embarrasses her, Says she's in the clouds, always in the clouds. Get out of the clouds, Claudette. But she can't help it. She's exploring massive gardens and colorful bugs on strange new worlds. Claudette feels things more than others, much more. Like the shame of not being invited to any birthday parties. Not one party. Every day her parents ask her who she played with at lunch, and every day she lowers her chin and tells them that she doesn't want to talk. Her parents ask her teacher, and her teacher tells them she likes to play alone. Not so much play, more like collect and observe things. Flowers, weeds, beetles, worms, rocks. Some kids are just loners. 
Every day her parents ask her about her friends, and every day the shame returns. They want her to have friends. More than that, they want a list of names for her birthday. But she doesn't have a list of names. She doesn't even have one name. Evan is 14 years old, and he knows something his father doesn't. The thought thrills him, amazes him, scares him. There is something his father doesn't know, something the owner of one of the most profitable mines in all of Seattle doesn't know. His father manages his workers with an iron fist. No, not an iron fist, brass knuckles. He calls them maggots, groveling maggots. He's about to discover he's wrong. They're more than maggots, much more. They're men, and men working together can bring change. One of these men is inspiring others to take their lives back. If they can stand together, maybe, just maybe, they can bring in the Union. With the Union, they'll have rights. More than rights, they'll have dignity, freedom, time. Time to spend with their friends. Time to spend with their family. Time to be human. Evan knows something his father doesn't know. And he feels empowered. Evan's father thrusts him to the ground, calls him weak tells him he's got to stop being so nice to the maggots, stop talking to them, stop helping them, keep them in line, break them, let them know who's boss. If you give them an inch, they'll take a yard. They're just using you. Evan knows better than to say anything. His father punched and broke his jaw last year when he showed weakness. This year, he'd rather not sip dinner through a straw. This year, he holds back, bites his tongue. He wants to tell his father about the union, but doesn't. He feels ashamed. Torn between his loyalty for his father and his friends, Bob, Tom, Jim, they deserve more. Evan enjoys creating something from nothing. He's not an artist, but he enjoys sketching and he hides his sketches from his father. His father forbids sketching. Sketching is for weaklings, vagabonds, gypsies. He wants Evan to do worthy things. He drags Evan to his most profitable mine, he teaches him how to manage maggots. He's hands-on, very hands-on, abusive, violent, brutal. The key is to break them, break their will, break their spirit. Once broken, a human is a tool that can be wielded to do anything. Broken. It's what he did to his mother. It's what he's doing to him. But Evan still sketches. Sketching is defiance. 